Hello and welcome to Phantomonium, where a bunch of nerds from the internet to gather around and talk about nerd shit. I'm your host, Storm. And with me I have the amazing Lightning and the fantastic Ash. Welcome to the show, guys. Ooh, I'm fantastic. Nice You're only amazing. I can be both. All right. My mom says I'm both. Oh, oh, man, I wish my mom said that about me. Anyway, the topic for today's Fandemonium is franchises. Basically, you either die here or live yourself long enough to be here to see yourself become Transformers. God damn. <laughs> <laughs> the Michael I, Bay Transformers. I. What's funny is I went so many years without seeing that. And then I finally watched all of them this summer, really? and I was like, "Oh, okay." I wow. never like I watched this. Sh I watched Beast Wars as a kid, Fuck and yeah. I had Transformers, and I had Transformers. But like when the movies came out, I was like, "Eh." I mean, I was kind of the same way, but I watched it when they came out, and I, I guess because of that, as each one came out, I was like, "I don't get why we're still doing this." I I, I just I never watched them, and I watched them all together. Then I was like, "Oh." Now I don't regret not watching them in theaters. I actually stopped at two. After two, I was like, I can't take this. What? What's going on? Let's see, I guess I saw up to the Marky Mark one. So I guess that would be three? With was Mark it three four where he came in? I want to say it's four. Yeah, because I think fourth yeah. one's the one that's coming out soon, right? No. See, I don't even no, know! I don't even, I don't even know! They're already on five. I don't even know! Did they just release last night? I don't even know. Something like that. Whatever. Anyway, the <laughs> oh, for this, I want to talk about some franchises that we do like. Ones that actually mm. ended, like took a bow, yes. and just unlike unlike Transformers, yeah, they just took a bow and left the stage, feeling yeah, leaving the audience feeling satisfied and ready for the next show, as opposed to dragging a lifeless corpse across the stage and puppeteering it. <laughs> like so many other shows that just need to die with dignity like Transformers <laughs> that's just gonna be that's gonna be the theme the whole thing yes. like Transformers I'm gonna have so gag. many friends it's hating me for this one cause for some reason I have some friends that like the Michael Bay films even now what? I'm just like, uh, uh, not worth <laughs> keeping his friends some new, you need some new friends <laughs> alright so what are so what are some franchises that you think did well Storm me? Uh, the first one that yeah. I can think of is Yu Yu Hakusho from yeah. the old Toonami days. Like, I fucking love that show. Yeah, it was a great show. It had awesome characters with Yusuke being this delinquent, having a character walk into hero, fun side characters, ha went on quite a few fun adventures, and then it ended. That's the main thing I like about it. It actually had its arc, ended, and just... Let the next show come in. You know, that's that's kind of a problem you get with anime, too, is that, like, you have these 800, 1,000 episode shows. Oh, and God. you're just like, are you going to stop? You're never going to stop, mm -hmm. are you? I'm never going to ever finish One Piece, am I? No, that's the answer. The creator says he knows how he's going to end it. Apparently he's yes, the I only one who knows the finish line. I don't be I don't believe him. I don't believe I don't believe a sh I don't believe a shonen mangaka as far as I can throw them in that regard. But, I guess um, um let me ask a question real quick yeah. is um as the topic is franchises what is the definition of a franchise then? That's a I guess I think, as, as far as I know question. doesn't Yu Yu Hakusho only have just the the one anime series was there anything besides that? You're right. You're right. Uh basically you're right like uh Anything that was a uh, show, video game, or had a large marketing environment to it. <laughs> I Googled Google the actual term. Let me go ahead and bring that back up. <laughs> I kind of think of it as just stretching across like multiple properties. Yeah. I do I do feel like you can you can still appreciate Yu Yu show has having an actual ending. Yes, oh, yeah. definitely. Um, in the same way that I feel like you can appreciate Inuyasha for having an actual ending. Yeah, eventually uh, most of us eventually eventually uh, i mean it ended it did end <laughs> twice. it ended and it it ended twice but it ended she also managed to end ranma but i don't know how i feel about that one either yeah well that's true that's true well the manga ended the anime sort of just 
stopped. Uh, 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 yeah, for Rama, uh, for Rama or Inuyasha? For oh, uh, Rama. Rama, yeah, it was just kind of blooped. Yeah. Yeah, but um, as far as like other anime, okay, so I hate to say it now because now that the new movie is coming out, it hasn't technically ended yet. Um, but despite the fact that Full Metal Alchemist like restarted like four times, um, or twice. Yeah. Um. Mm. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Let's see. What's the oh, no the 2003 then Brotherhood and everything. Um, like with the new movie aside, like it's who knows what that's actually gonna start. Maybe it yeah. may just be a little extra. Who knows? Yeah, we don't even um, know what it really is yet. Yeah, we don't really know. Um, I still feel like you know between you know all the games and the anime and the manga and the movies and everything that especially after Brother with Brotherhood brought everything to an end. The, the, it yes. ended. It, it took the manga. The manga ended. The Brotherhood ended the manga. It didn't try to make it anything more than it was. Like, the movies are non-canonical, technically speaking. Whatever. Um, but Final Alchemist ended, and it had a good ending. And it was... It, it makes... It it brought closure to this huge, massive franchise that I think if you tried to poke at it again, it, it could be dangerous, but we'll have to see. Yeah, I agree. Full Metal... Like, the ending to Full Metal Brotherhood was so perfect, and... With this new movie coming out, I honestly think we can just sort of not uh, discount it because I doubt it's going to reignite the franchise, seeing as they sort of did perfectly the first time around with the first two anime. Yeah, like hopefully it just kind of, it'll just end up being a nod, and that'll be it. Hopefully, it'll just be yeah. like, hey, here's a movie, and then we're gonna let it go back into the shadows. And but like one thing you made me remember just now about Full Metal Alchemist is that you know while um the two anime series did a good job of telling their story and you know wrapping it up and not I guess not stretching it out longer than it need to be, even the the video game which the which name escapes me right now the the PS2 one uh, did a good oh, job of telling its own original story and you know yeah. wrapping things up there too. It really you know, did. As, like as yeah, far every- as like an anime adaptation for a game, you know, you don't come in with very high expectations, but it, it met them just fine, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, I think every single time that someone tries to tell the full metal, luckily, every single time someone tries to tell the full metal <laughs> alchemist story, they do a pretty darn good job. You yeah. know, like, it's gonna it's come to some offshoots, I think it was like a GBA card game or whatever. Yeah, but, but, like, yeah. but, but that's fine. Well, you, can, like, you can allow a couple of weird shit, but it's fine. Full metal is one of those weird properties that is fortunate enough to have have all of its installments be good and anything that falls short of the bar to not really taint the franchise. It's yeah. A- it seems yeah. like no matter what, whoever's working on it seems to always have, like, it's always in good hands, I would say. Yeah, I could definitely see that. It's it's lucky in that regard. It's either lucky there- or shows how much pride the people who handle this story take in it to... Make sure it's in the right hands to begin with. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can definitely see that. Because I, if I'm not mistaken, Fullmetal Alchemist has a distinction of being one of the unbiased best animes ever. Period. Like it has yes, been it's it's everything. definitely it's definitely like on those. Ob- no, objectively speaking, it's probably one of the. Both of them in their own way. I mean, you both can of argue, them, though, I'd say the the original could, one does not get the I guess the respect I feel it could deserve. I know I feel the exact same way too because I me mean, I watched the I watched two thousand three back when it first aired on Toonami before Brotherhood yeah. was even a thought, yep. and so like that was my first introduction to Full Metal, and it got me into the series, you yep. know. And so I think a lot of people who came into the you know quote unquote fandom a little bit later are like, well, oh, Brotherhood followed the manga board. It's like okay, well, but you don't understand the original series was really good. Like yeah. it's like it went into a direction, <laughs> but it still did a good job with its own it story. Really, you know? I mean, cause especially when you could take into consideration it was made when the manga wasn't finished yet or anything. Yeah, so it's like they, they didn't have much choice I at mean, the time. I can still respect they, them for that. Exactly, precisely. They told the writer ahead of time that they would be doing their own ending, and she was actually kind of stoked to see what they did with it. Oh yeah, absolutely. They had her blessing, and as I mentioned previously, the original series is how I got into her anime in general like exactly I th- just with- that's for a lot of people are like that the 2003 yeah. anime was one of their first ones i mean i always mm-hmm. got in with uh toonami but full metal being a darker show than what i was used to really got me into like looking at things like berserk and stuff like that i mean just the, my first episode it 
word still just sticks with me for, to oh, this God. day, yeah. as I've mentioned previously yeah. on this show. Um, I guess for me, the, the franchise that really comes to mind is one that just really nailed everything right was the, the Prince of Persia, Sands of Time trilogy, back in the uh, PS2 era. Like, um, I, I know most of the people think. who are familiar with the series, they just played the first game. And the first game, like it had a lot of, um, it had a lot of strong points, like the characterization, the the story, the the art, the the combat was fun. It's just there was, um, I guess, a couple small things going for it. Like uh, one of the things that people mentioned was that the, the combat was fun, but it lacked depth. They made the second one, and the story took a big hit, but they made the combat more fun. But all the while, the the environments were still were still very fun to run around to. You get to the third one, they start fixing the story back up. But maybe some of the characterization is kind of lacking now. So it's like it, collectively, like all three of them together have like everything that's done right. But each one has its own sort of thing that's lacking in it. But I would say okay. like collectively, they managed to nail every aspect of it and tell a very nice story and, and wrap it up properly. Now, do you feel like the newer game like wrecks that or just you're just going to like ignore it? Do you mean the, the new Sands of Time uh, game that they stuck in there after the movie? I mean, yeah, basically. Yeah, I, I I wasn't a fan of it. Like, I really felt like it was kind of a a cash grab after the the movie came out to try and I, I guess get something from the film. The film. How, how did you feel about the film? Like, as a like you I, you said you played the games first, right? They yes, I did, and uh, I'll be honest, I've done a I've done a lot of work to like uh, I guess write the film out of my memory. I don't remember it too well now, but <laughs> from what I remember, it's like I love the the way they brought elements of it to life like i remember them purposely nailing like the outfits and some of the i guess the moves that the prince does in there but there's a lot of story aspects that i thought were very silly i remember they're just like a lot of i, I guess a uh, silly nonsense of it being a, a video game movie You're not trying to necessarily be just um, a fun action movie but you know we have to be a video game movie we have to be you know a little bit special in that way hmm. but um yeah, I'd say the main things they nailed were just more of the, some of the aesthetic aspects. There were there were elements of like telling the story of Prince of Persia and crafting a, a nice film that they really did not hit. Like I, I I actually do think that Jake Gyllenhaal did fine with what he was given, but he really wasn't given too much to work with. I think if you had made if you had tried to make a proper Prince of Persia movie, then the outcome would have been a lot better. So one of the. I guess a brief spoiler real quick with um, the first game is that there's a kind of a speech that the prince does at the beginning about time and how time is like a river. And then not to spoil, but in the third game, the story wraps up and he kind of ends us on that speech. And it's a way to kind mm-hmm. of tie the first and the third game back together and kind of like, um, you know, circle a franchise around, just like tie a knot on the whole thing, bring it to a close. And in the film, the little flourishes like that are gone. Like there, there is no such speech like that to really draw it into what had already been previously done. So the film doesn't really try to translate Prince of Persia. It's more just like a Yeah, it tries to be like half its own thing, half of the half its half of the original Prince of Persia. It's kinda like lost in between. Then let me ask you, do you feel like the good in the franchise outweigh the bad? Yes I do. Because like you you can you can look at something like that and say it's kind of a cash grab and say it's a write off like that. Like, I mainly look at the the game series when I talk about this. Not so much the film series, because the film was kind of a one-off. You see, since then, you know, there hasn't been any talk of doing another one. It's very much been, like, forgotten to time, I guess, but... Yeah. Well, so that becomes my question, because I played... Like, I never really played the Sands of Time trilogy. I played the original mm-hmm. trilogy. Um, what the, do you mean? Oh, the, 19, the... the 1989 rotoscope. Oh, wow. On my yeah. old MS-DOS P13 gotcha. fucking bullshit computer. Um, back in the... I'm not, see, I'm not even that much older than y'all. Like, oh, that's you're just too like, old school for me, eh? That's just how old my computer was growing up. <laughs> um, so, like, so, like, for me, when I think of Prince of Persia, I think of those first, those three original games. Mm-hmm. Like, that's what I grew up with. Like I never had a PS. Mm. So like Sands of Time isn't even like my isn't even my version of Prince of Persia. <laughs> when I like think of like the games that exist, yeah, which yeah. I so do you think as a whole that like is that a good thing or a bad thing for the franchise as a whole? What like is, is that, that is that does that make it does that make it a weak franchise or does that make it like a more like a stronger franchise because it's been going on for so long? Well, I I think it's key to note that. 
when it went to Sands of Time, it very much had to like reinvent itself. Like it's it was clearly different from the the previous games that came before it. It was like trying well, to yeah, carve out its own, like different different identity. So yeah. it's it's still Prince of Persia, but it's very much like a, a a branch off of Prince of Persia, I would say. So do you feel like so if so not too dissimilar to sort of the Doctor Who reboot that we saw <laughs> yeah. a while ago. Like, sure. Well, not not a lot of people knew about the originals, but. Mm-hmm. There was still that fan base, and it's sort of this kind of this weird disconnect between the two eras. But still, the we wouldn't have the new one without having the old one. So I guess I guess guess the question becomes like, do we think of do we want to think of them as two different franchises or one big franchise that isn't? That's a good quite? question. Yeah. Um. I... Be- I, go on. No, you go ahead. I'm still trying to form the form the thought. Yeah, because because when I think when I think about something like Doctor Who, like, um, it went on for so long. Because I used to watch. I'm such a dork. Because I used to watch the like third Doctor on um, reruns when I was a kid. Um, and so with the new Doctor Who, it was. It was interesting because like. I remember my mom being like, because she used to watch the old Doctor Who, and her being excited that there was going to be more Doctor Who, but also like being like, why is there more Doctor Who? Like, she was kind of <laughs> like, I love Doctor Who, but why is there more Doctor Who? But now that there is going to, now that after it started, she like fell in love with Chris Eccleston, so whatever. Mm-hmm. But, um, um, no, I think you. I think you made a fair point that I kind of yeah. need to revise this and say, you know, the the Prince of Persia: Sands of Time trilogy that I'm familiar with is, yeah, it, it's good, but it's not the it is not the complete franchise, and that's an important yeah. distinction to make. Yeah, because I mean, Prince of Persia are awesome games. Like they're amazing and hard, yeah. and they led to my first rage as a video gamer. <laughs> Yeah, even if, I think even if, I think now even if something undergoes like that massive sort of identity shift that I feel like it did between yeah. the old school games and the same time trilogy, it's still the same franchise, get, even though it does kind of change a lot of its um, vision for itself. You gotta take the new and the old uh, as well with the good and the bad. Mm-hmm. You can't just sort of a, more than the sum of its parts kind of thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And actually, I want to ascend my audio statement with you, Yuhaku Show. Now, <laughs> I actually have a better thing that just came to mind that I'm angry at myself I didn't think of sooner. The first two Digimon seasons. Now, Storm, I will stop you right there to say you can't just say the first two seasons. Okay, in that case, yeah. I'm adding that out. Fuck yeah. that. Because <laughs> that's the whole franchise. It's the whole thing. Yeah. The whole thing is there. I just get my thing. Fuck. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and that out. How dare. <laughs> Thank you for yeah. calling me on my bullshits. No worries. <laughs> Every time. Every time. Okay, so then this okay, this is my next question, I guess, since we're talking about so So we're talking about good franchises. So if a franchise gets really effing weird toward the end, but it still actually ends. Are we calling that a good ending? Are you satisfied with my how example? It yeah, my give, example, give example for this is gonna be Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Okay. That show gets weird past like see like past the musical episode basically. So when she dies like the third time, um, it gets weird, and it probably should have ended about two seasons before it did but it still ended and it still had an ending as a man with passing knowledge of the but it was good i'm curious actually how she could die multiple times i mean i just have a passing knowledge of that world she just she just does like the first time she like the first time she died it's been a while since i've rewatched it i think the first time she dies um it's like it's to fulfill a prophecy, like the Slayer has to die. And so she technically dies, but she gets brought back to life by like CPR or some shit. Um, then she dies. And uh, then she, you know what? She may only die three times total. Cause in the musical episode, she's like, and I died twice. So she's died twice by the musical episode. 
And in that time, she, like, literally dies and goes to heaven. Like, spoilers, whatever. Spoilers for a 15-year-old show. Whatever. <laughs> um, she dies and goes, like, goes to heaven. But then they all manage to, like, b- literally pull her soul from heaven back into her physical body. Hmm. And she, it's great. It's great. Like, cause it causes like this whole like existential crisis. And she's just like banging this vampire to like rid herself of these mental blocks. And then they make out and it's so fucking stupid, but it's also amazing at the same time. <laughs> but then again, the show should have ended before it even got that far in theory. Thoughts on the matter? So would you, would you describe the, the shitty ending as being kind of like a deus ex machina that they try to pull with it? Maybe. Like, Maybe. do you think it would have been more proper for her to just stay dead? I guess is you know what? What, what I mean. As I think about it, like, in hindsight, if she had just died, I really felt like what they were doing at the end of that season was setting itself up for the series to end, but then they kept going when they shouldn't have. But then they still end it. Like, and they still had a good ending. They were able to, like, make it work despite it getting really weird after that. Do you know who if the uh, series ended because the story writers and showrunners were like, okay, we're done, or were they just cancelled? and walked <laughs> Okay, so it's, it's, Joss, it's Joss Whedon, so it, you know, Joss Whedon's weird. So, like, he he ended it. Like, he was like, this. he ended the story. It wasn't like, a, oh, we're going to stop it, and then, like, um... We're just going to stop it. We're not going to give you a chance to end the story. Because they did that with Dollhouse, which was another one of his shows. Um, where, they, where he had expected to get more seasons and then didn't. And so didn't get to end his story after the first season. Um, he had he luckily got another season and like kind of racked it all up real fast. But um, with Buffy, like he, he was able to end it. Like He got his ending. So I don't know if it was like a studio saying, Joss, we're going to give you one more season, but then you got to stop. Or it was, and eh, we're done now. Fix it. Finish it. But it ended, and it had a good ending. Did it go on too long? I don't know, maybe a little bit. Hmm. Debatably. Yeah, it's, it feels like a gray area there. Like it, it does, when I think about it. it might just so then that's the question, really, is does the bad ending, like, mar its reputation? Like, do you think the bad ending ruins the series? If it was good up until then? See, I don't, I don't see for me, it didn't necessarily get bad. It just got weird. Like, <laughs> like it, it's, it was one of those things where it's like, you felt like the show should have ended when it, when it was, it, it felt like the, it felt like the show had two endings. The, it's like Futurama. Well, oh man, God, oh, I'm thinking about this now. Futurama was like that, where the first ending of Futurama was Devil's Hands, the, or uh, Idle Hands, the Devil's Playthings, which was a musical episode where Fry and Leela finally hook up, and um, it, it's great. It's a wonderful episode. Mm-hmm. And then they, have three, then they have the three movies. Then they got picked up again for another, I want to say, one or two seasons. Then they got canceled again. Then they finally got picked up again by Comedy Central, and then finally ended. Finally. Again. Finally ended. Again, hope to fucking God, they ended again. Um, <laughs> so that, so I think they both had that same problem where it was like the ending, the original ending was good. It, it, but with Futurama at least, like, and then when should I franchise? You know, this, I mean, honestly, I think considering the situation, Futurama did a great job in that regard. In that they ended the series once, it was amazing. It was a great ending. Like I love that episode. One of my favorites. I know the title and everything. And then they were given the chance to do more. And so they did. And it didn't necessarily like bring the series down. It was like they and they were ended before they really got to tell all the stories they wanted to tell, basically. So they were able to keep going. And then when they got when they got canceled again, it was like, well, that sucks. Oh, we're coming back. All right, great. And so it's like they keep getting cut short, but at least they're able to make it work when they're allowed to come back and f- continue telling their stories. Mm-hmm. And now that the show is like officially over, like officially, officially, like, I don't think they can come. They can't come back from the ending they wrote of the series. I, and they, I don't think they're going to try. I don't think they're really going to try either. Like I've read a lot of stuff about it. Mm-hmm. Um, that I think they did well with the situation they were put into and i think buffy kind of had that same thing where it was like okay we're gonna end the series 
but you want more Buffy? Oh God. Okay. Um, then we're going to end it again. You know? So I think that is, I think that's a, a that, and that, I know that happens a lot. Not a lot. It happens. It happens. It's a thing. You know, people that write something, they think this is going to be, happens. I'm still talking. Y'all can shut me up at any point. You know, that's right. <laughs> How about Back to the Future? With Back to the Future, he was just going to write, he was just going to do Back to the Future. Um, uh, Zemeckis. Zemeckis? Yeah. No, it's not right. I, oh, someone yeah, I'm pretty sure fact checked me later. I think it was Zemeckis. Um, my brain just suddenly was like, wait, what? Um, he never wanted to do two and three. Ever. He was like, I don't want to do two and three. I don't want to, I don't want to do these movies. Why are you making me do these movies? Um, basically, they had to let him do Who Framed Roger Rabbit before he would do Back to the Future 2. He's like, fine, I'll give you more movies if you let me do this Academy Award winning movie <laughs> instead mm -hmm. um, in between. Um, so like that was kind of his thing where it's like he told the story he wanted to tell back the future and then the studios came in and were like hey so we're going to need you to do more because it's making us money and I think that like he did the best he could in that circumstance because back the future two and three are still decent movies like they're not I don't feel like they're as they're as strong narratively as one is but they aren't like I, I don't think they aren't it's all there's to it um but they did the best they could. He, he, given the situation he was in, he was like, well, I gotta make this a franchise. I wasn't gonna, but now I gotta. This is what I'm gonna do. And so I think he, he did a good job. Like, the whole team did the best they could with what they had and made a franchise where there wasn't supposed to be one. And it's a good franchise. I love all three of those movies. Oh, the first one, the, the first one is the best, but I love all three of them. So, sort of like, what happened to The Matrix, where it, what was clearly meant to be a standalone movie became a trilogy. Mm -hmm. Basically, yeah, I think the Bukowski's were probably put in a very similar circumstance. Except now, I, I would argue the Bukowski... Back to the Future trilogy is good. Yeah, I, I don't. <laughs> I mean, I feel like that's definitely an example of we were given, we were told to make it a franchise, and we weren't ready, and, and we didn't do it very well. Like, yeah, I think it's pretty easy to start a bad franchise. Pretty much, the signs <laughs> are this thing's older than your grand. And parents, and you want to take it out back and shoot it to finally give it a, it some rest, right? Just like put that, put that puppy down. But, uh, that graphic imagery there. I'm sorry, I'm just really <laughs> bitter at Pokemon. I'm really. <laughs> I want Pokemon okay. to end so long ago. It should have ended. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, so now that we're here, um, what what are some franchises that need to be taken out back and shot? Pokemon. Or maybe like went on way too long. Uh, well, since I'm on the topic of Pokemon as is, <laughs> <laughs> I'm really not a fan that they keep just pushing on the adventures and just keeping the main protagonist ten. Like, I, if you want, let's specify. We're talking specifically about the anime, right? Yeah, yeah. Specifically the anime. I mean, they can keep selling as many games and cards as they would like. That's not. I feel like that won't really change a thing in the grand scheme of things merchandise wise but because you know kids need plushies i gave my baby cousin a pikachu who plushie when she was born but anime has just it's nearly outlived me at this point which is kind of weird when did the anime 92 did, did it really come on in 1992 in japan right I don't know. For some reason, the date 92 is with me. I could be slightly... I'll look it up. I'll Google it. <laughs> yeah, I'm on it right now. <laughs> like, for some reason, it might be 96. Because the only franchise that I can think of uh, that's outlet... 97. 97. First yeah. episode date, 97. What am I thinking of as 92? I come back thinking of, like, Sailor Moon or some shit. Don't know. Yeah, 97. <laughs> but, yeah. I... I'm always annoyed with a show that refuses to advance the characters. Like, I actually don't mind that the protagonist, that Ash, does not win tournaments. That doesn't bother me. It's an important lesson to teach kids that no matter how hard you try, sometimes you will still fail. I think that's a fine lesson, and Pokemon shows that in an optimistic light as opposed to a pessimistic view. But if they have to keep the show at least age up the character or even even better change protagonists 
That's what Digimon does. It has its own story, it ends these characters' journey, and then picks up a new bunch of kids and does their story. That's why I've always preferred Digimon to Pokemon. Do you think that would save the do you think that would be something that would save the Pokemon fran not save, save isn't the yeah, maybe it is. Revitalize um, definitely. Because <laughs> I know that definitely the art style change was an effort to do that. Yeah, I think that you was, think it was enough. From what I understand, that was met with mixed results from the fans. Yeah, a lot of people didn't like it. Yeah, I mean, hell, the <laughs> I was cute, them. but whatever. Yeah, he I actually looks it. ten years old for a change since the anime first start, started. But he didn't start, so he's going backwards. <laughs> he's, he's Benjamin Button. Button. He's Benjamin, Button. He's Benjamin Buttoning. Damn it. <laughs> But if I understand correctly, the biggest hype the latest season of Pokemon has gotten is pretty much, hey guys, uh, Brock and Misty are back. Those characters you love, it's just like the old days. Which is weird. Because, so that's something very interesting because, like, I mean, Brock and Misty were on, like, they, when I think of, like, the time span of the Pokemon anime, they haven't been on in, like, 20 years. You know, like, or 15 years. Like, Brock and Misty left when I was, would have been, like, late elementary. They've made I guess. cameos? Brock came back for Yeah, like, season? they left a long time ago. So it's like, who's Brock and Misty for? Yeah. Because the kids, because the kids don't know who Brock and Misty are. Like, they didn't play, they didn't play blue and red. They don't know who Brock and Misty are. Neither did I. I think so. Know. Exactly. Like, I mean, like, so who is it, what's Brock and Misty for? Is it for the, the parents who are having to watch Pokemon with their kids now? Is that what it is? <laughs> like, legit. Like, I think it's an attempt to appeal to the, the hardcore weebs who would still you know watch a show that's aimed for children nowadays. Which, God, I wouldn't be surprised. You're probably right. Instead of catering to the old fans, they should just keep reinventing Ash. If I understand yeah. correctly, I could be mistaken well, with this. On on that point, that's that's I think that's where I'm gonna disagree with one of your points where it's where you say it's okay that Ash never wins. One of the things that I think lets us let go of the each cast of Digimon and move on to a new one is that we see those characters come to an end of their journey. We see them finally accomplish what they want to do, and then we can, you know, accept that victory and move on. But it's like Ash never has that ultimate victory. So I think that's part of the reason why everyone wants to stick to Ash is because we want to see him finally do it. If he never actually does it, then no one wants to move on from him. That's a fair counterpoint, yeah. Like, if Ash were to finally win a league, we could retire his character and pick up someone new. Mm -hmm. like, I and then maybe... That. And you know what? And that's, I mean, that's something you gotta teach the kids eventually. Yes. That it may take you 15 years to get there. <laughs> no, no, I guess it would be 20 at this point. It'd be twenty. Cause the show's one of twenty years, ninety-seven. Yeah, so this is the twentieth yeah. year. Um, that it may take you twenty years, but you win eventually. You know, like yeah. that would be that would be that's the, is that is that the ending we want for Pokemon? We want do, do we want Ash? We want Ash to finally win the to Pokemon finally League. win. I think that would be a fair end to his character. Not that you bring it up, have yep. him win because he he I always know. loses the Pokemon League or the Elite Four. Or... Whenever it's like the the highest most pressure thing, where you would finally like become the Pokemon master, that's where he always loses. That's where he always chokes. He came close a few times, I think. I don't know. I have friends who still watch the show. I stopped after Brock and Misty left. <laughs> yeah, same more or less. But uh, I pretty much also stopped playing the games after Gold, mostly because they came out for the new handhelds, and I mm. didn't have one of those. But mm -hmm. I've. Yeah, I've I've played them up to X and Y. Like not a lot. Like not all of them a lot. I've heard the like, games have continued to be good. I'm happy about it. Oh, oh yeah, no, they're definitely good. Resign, I think we I think we got X we got we got X two and Y two. But we didn't get we didn't get Sun and Moon. Cause we're like, eh. But um but they still can yeah, they still continue to be good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You know, for a given value of good. Some people are always gonna people are always gonna bitch about Nintendo games or whatever. Always. Yeah. People always bitch about Nintendo games. Leave Nintendo alone. Leave Nintendo alone. Like <laughs> Nintendo's the sweet old grandpa of gaming. Right? Nintendo tries. Nintendo tries so hard. They really do. Like I love Nintendo, and I'm a f I'll admit I have got a little bit of a fangirl in me of Garden Nintendo, but they still try really hard. <laughs> like 
I can't hate Nintendo. I was raised on Nintendo. All, me and my sisters ha have that in common. And we and they don't even play games anymore. Like they just want to make fun games for us to play. Not <laughs> they just want to make fun games. They don't even need to resort to anything <laughs> edgy to make a good game. They just need yeah. to entertain the audience. And they do that very well. Right. I'm just... Just let the anime either pick up a new protagonist or just end while it still has some traction left, I assume. Yeah. That's Agreed. Mine. Agreed. Well, you two, I don't want to just write about Yeah, Elsie, 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 what's yours? Because I got a big one and I'm going to go on for a while. So, won't you okay. talk for I'm Mine's ready. a little different with what I'm going to say, but. Oh, God, okay. do it. I'm curious. All right, so. This is a franchise that needs to be put down, but it's not necessarily because it's been very bad. And that is Half-Life. Half-Life mm, 2. You know what? I agree. I agree. And this I mainly agree. comes to mind because of the very recent news, which was... So, I guess to set the stage a bit, the Half-Life 2 originally came out, like, over 10 years ago now. And the promise to... It set up a lot of important story points, and... Valve started doing this episode model with the idea of um, we'll be able to make the game shorter, but we'll be able to make them faster and provide the the story ending that you guys were looking for. You know, we'll be able to you know just wrap up the story that way and be able to do it quicker and faster than normal. Yeah, so we, we get the first good. one. There's a huge gap. We finally get the second one, and I, again, it keeps it keeps getting us closer to this final conclusion. And sets up like new characters. A lot of drama happens. You know, there's a lot that goes on, but it's all setting up for the final conclusion. And where is that fucking conclusion been? It is we people, the fans of Half Life, have been waiting. I'm I'm looking right now. I want to see how long it's been since Half Life Two Episode Two came out. I'm sorry. Edit out. Drum this, roll. Edit out this gap. Yeah. Okay, I'll edit this out most. Uh, my, my, my awesome drum roll. Okay. Half-Life 2, Episode 2, came out in 2007. Ooh, Fans have now been yeah. waiting 10 years. 10 years, right. 10 years yeah, for the final right. conclusion of this game. And the original Half-Life game, Half-Life 2 game, came out in 2004. So that is 13 years that fans have been waiting for just the conclusion to this fucking game. And... Part of the, I, I guess, the painful process of being a fan is that you would watch how everyone at Valve who worked on the series, who was a key part of it, slowly left. The three lead writers of the previous games up until that uh, gradually left the company. And it seemed like the game was never going to get made. Then, just the other day, uh, the other day at the time recording this, let's say, like, um, early, uh, early September... The news finally, not news, but like the one of the former writers for Valve, who was the lead writer for the Half-Life series, he basically publishes a synopsis of what Episode 3 was going to be. And it's pretty obvious that part of the reason why he did this was the frustration of Valve to finally release this game and provide some closure to the fans and finish up their series and tell the, you know, the, the good game that fans have been wanting because everything previous all the previous entries in the series have been fantastic and so when valve says oh we just need a little bit more time to make this one as polished as the other ones you know everyone believes it but it's been over 10 years people are frustrated and the author of the franchise is getting frustrated with the company's you know just struggle to release the fucking game already he yeah. publishes the story and everyone reads it and it's like oh this is fantastic it's great it's exactly what we want it's everything we could have wanted but it's never going to be real because at this point, you know, fans can look at the can see the writing of the wall and see, hey, all the people that worked on this series are gone. You know, if they're making something new, then it's not it's not going to be this. The story was clearly published because the fans and Mark Laylaw, the author, realized that this game isn't coming out ever. You know, the, the Half-Life series is not going to get that proper closure that fans have been asking for for so long. Wait, you say People the, want it to finally finish up, they want it to finally die, but they're not letting it. Did you say the author was Mike Laidlaw? Mark Laidlaw. Oh, Mark Laidlaw, thank you. Uh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I know that was a lot at once. <laughs> no, because that, that's legit, though, because it's like... I was trying... There was another series 
There was another game series I was trying to think of while you were talking about that, and it still it escapes me. I'll probably think of it like 2 a.m. tonight. Mm-hmm. But um, um, that's you know, that's a shame that that has to happen sometimes. Yeah, and that, that's Where kind of the frustrating yeah. thing with Half Life is that all the the games that have been made for it have been wonderful and beloved by the by critics and community alike. And it's just that, and the story is clearly there. And it's written for this final game, but it's just this struggle to get the company that made it to just finish it. Because then you end up with something like Andromeda, where, like, oh god, Duke Nukem Forever that just comes. It's, out you know, you end up with, yeah, you end up with these games that it's like, and then there's a lot of that's happened to a lot of games, where it was like, you know, the fans wanted something, they wanted something, they wanted something. And mm-hmm. either either the company was like, Haha, you're never going to get it, or this if they felt falls apart, you know, yeah. or like, you know, it's a situation where the, when they do finally release the game, it's so disappointing, they might as well have just not bothered. Yeah. Duke Nukem is actually a very interesting parallel to draw it to yeah. because, you know, it was worked on forever. It had so much hype built into it. I guess there was those uh, original trailers for Duke Nukem Forever yeah. 2. But um, always- I-, I guess the difference that I would make is that when you saw the the story finally get released for Half-Life 3, you know, no one was disappointed. Everyone was like, this is great. This is exactly what we would have wanted. Why can't we have this? You know, it wasn't disappointing in the same way that Duke Nukem was. The, the only disappointment was this, why can't this be real? Yeah. That's that's a good point. So maybe now it should just be over. Yeah, uh, like it's, this is more or less the, the ending that we get. Here's the ending. Here you go. Done. Pretty much, it's written DLC at this point. Yeah, it's just mm-hmm. watch it be revived in like tw- another twenty years. Yeah. <laughs> Half Life. Half Life. Episode two point five. <laughs> just like whatever. Well, I mean, because that kind of—I mean, that kind of happened I mean, to, at least, a lesser ex- no, lesser extent. That's a bad example. I was thinking of Evangelion, but that's not quite the same. Um, oh yeah. Where it's like it ends, but then like, oh, we're gonna redo it, yeah. you know? And then it's like, okay, you could have just left well enough alone, but okay. <laughs> and the new this, the new stuff's good, but like, yeah, I actually preferred the movies to the series. Yeah. Way to personal tastes, like the original series is fine and well but i just sort of preferred the pacing in the movies a bit more well i mean it's one of those things where like in the original series like he didn't know what the hell he was doing he was like making it up on the fly yeah. like the whole thing was made up on the fly like people have asked him like did you do this this and this and he's like i don't know whatever so i think the movies were able to like take what was already out and like at least make it make more sense like it would not quite like they were able to take the story as it ended up being like I said, since he was like flying by the seat of his pants when he was making it it's kind of like okay well this is the story that you gave us what the f- what the hell um okay we'll make it into something that makes sense um so i think it's probably yeah the one of the one of the, one of the times a rebooted franchise did really well in that regard <laughs> technically lord but of the rings is also a reboot seeing as they had the <sighs> rack and bass movies first yeah, those are those are oh for what they for the the, the what movies the for their bass. tongue. What is what is that? Uh, you don't mean the Bakshi animated films, do you? Bakshi, that was it. Yeah, okay. I, I knew what you were talking. Like I knew <laughs> oh I knew what you were I knew what you were talking about, but I was trying to make a connection between like okay, what is he saying versus what. Because <laughs> uh, the, Bakshi, the get... Bakshi movies are good for what they are. I always confuse those for some reason. Whatever. The Baxi movies are good for what they are. There's another Baxi movie that y'all need to see. I'll tell you about it later. My big one, if you'll permit, is I need Harry Potter to die. <laughs> I really need Harry Potter to just die already. Um, I grew up with this. I grew up with the book series. You know, I'm that exact like age bracket. Like that perfect age bracket where I started in like third grade and the seventh book came out my senior year of high school and i was able to go get it at the midnight release i read every single book and i still have all my hardback copies and i had lego sets and i had dolls i still have them um a couple of them you know i had but like because that because i you know like that it blew up it blew up merchandise wise Mm -hmm. like harry potter exploded 
which happens, you know, it's all well and good. You know, things like that happen. They explode. Whatever. You get toys now. Great. Now I can have a Hermione doll. My life is great. You know, I'm a happy little, you know, 12 year old. Um, and then, you know, the movies come out. I think the first one came out and I was like in sixth grade. Um, awesome. I get Harry Potter movies. Oh my God. I'm so excited. Blah, blah, blah. You know, I know it introduced me to a bunch of really great actors who I sort of knew, but didn't really know. Then I got to meet them like officially. And then like, the seven, and then I have, you know, they had the Fantastic Beasts Where to Find Them book and the Quidditch Through the Ages book, and it was like, okay, whatever. I had them all. Then the seventh book comes out. Hate the seventh book. Really? I hated the seventh book. I was like, it was really, Harry Potter was a really weird thing for me because when I was a kid in the first couple of books, I was like, yeah, Harry Potter. But then, like, as I got older and I started writing myself, like, I started, like, writing fiction when i was like four, 13 or 14 um some of it got published some of it didn't some like local literary magazines and stuff um and so as i got older it, got, it gets easier and easier to kind of pick out the like <laughs> what what come on rolling what you doing you know yeah, especially when you're reading other books you know because i was also reading like hard sci-fi like harry harrison ray bradbury and asimov and like c.s lewis and all that kind of good stuff and so when the seventh book, so as, as, as the series progressed, like, I, I, it didn't age with me as well as it could have. Whatever, no big deal. Seventh book comes out, I hate the seventh book. I'm like, are you fucking, I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? Like, this is how you're going to end it? You're going to introduce this, like, deus ex machina that you haven't mentioned in six books so far? You're going to bring up the Hallows and, oh yeah, by the way, your invisibility cloak was owned by death one time. And it's like, what? Like, it's, it made no sense to me. It was so dumb. I hated it. I hated the seventh book. Um, I stayed up 48 hours straight to read it, <laughs> which didn't help. Um, and then I was like, well, whatever. And now it's over. Okay. Then there's Harry Potter world. And I'm like, well, okay. At least the story's over. That's all well and good, I guess. Um, but at least the story's over. I mean, they still have, you know, rides for the Terminator rides, you know, whatever. It's fine. And the movies keep going and the movie ends. And I'm like, okay, the story's been told. This is all well and good. It needs to stop. She needs to stop. She needs to stop trying to make Harry Potter a thing. <laughs> because, like, when Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, the movie was going to come out. And don't even get me started on that movie. Oh, my God. Um, the holes the stupidity in that movie um which had been had amazing animals like the like the the creatures were really well done but the rest of it was stupid um i saw it um but then she starts creating pottermore and she creates the the new play and which i mean i've read parts of the play <sighs> it's like it's it's some i it's some it's some fan fiction ass bullshit what it is um, and like not even like good fan fiction, like my immortal ask fan fiction. Like you expect Ebony Darkness, Dementia, Raven Way to be like center stage the whole time. Um, and then she comes to Pottermore and she's like, "Well, the American Wizarding School is based off of random Native American whatever, and it's what what it and it kills me. It kills me because." It now has become, I'm very vehement about this, it's become very apparent that J.K. Rowling has no idea how to build her world. She wrote Harry Potter as a singular story with no concept of how the rest of the world in her Harry Potter fiction works. And she could get away with it for seven books, for seven children's books. She could get away with it. But now that it won't die, now that she has to, like, write this movie, there's going to be more Fantastic Beast movies, and there's going to be more stuff, and maybe she has another play. I don't freaking know. It's become apparent she has no idea what the hell she's doing. And it sucks because now for me, as a huge Harry Potter fan, it's ruined the entire rest of the series. Like, I I've tried to go back and, like, reread the first book, and I can't even do it anymore because it's, like... Now I know that it's not living in an authentic universe because she went, she went too far. She basically wrote outside her means. Like she, it wasn't, she, cause she didn't have to at first. She could write her seven books. They're in, generally internally consistent, but the minute 
that it started having to creep outside that seven book series, none of the rest of it makes any sense. It's all just like, it's all bull crap. It makes no sense whatsoever. I'm like, so for you, look what, you, look what you've done. Look what you've done. For you, going outside the principal seven series is the straw that broke the camel's back, essentially. Basically, basically, what it was like it, it didn't end the seven the seven book series didn't end well. It didn't end great. It had a bad ending. Everyone, everyone hates the epilogue. Like every, like I know, I don't know anybody who likes the Harry Potter epilogue. Um, and the fact that they tried, it was, it was the attempt to make it a, more than it is. The attempt to make it a franchise ruined it. It didn't. It could have been a seven book series. It could have been a huge seven book series. It could have been a seven book series. It could have been seven movies. Here's some merchandise. Done. And that could have been the end. And we all could have just let it live its course and then dies a nice memory. But we're, it's still being shoved. It's still, it still keeps popping up, like, ever so often. Where it's like, what, you're still here? Why are you? No, go, go, go away. Go back in the sack. Go back in the box. You don't need to be out right now. Why is Johnny Depp in a Harry Potter movie? What is going on? So you, you know, like, to go back under the, the cupboards. <laughs> can you just go back in the cupboard, right? <laughs> That's how I feel. That's how I feel. I feel like the the attempt to franchise something because it wasn't like you know, it's, if you're gonna call something a franchise, you know, it's like movies, books, toys, theme parks, whatever. Like the the it could have been a series and a movie. No park, no Pottermore, no the whatever the stupid play is called. Um, the cur- cursed, the cursed, child. cursed Child. You know, it could have been no Fantastic Beast movie. It could have just been like, this is it, and it told a story, and we'd be done. You know, like the fan, like especially the Fantastic Beast stuff. The Fantastic Beasts, where to find them in Quidditch through the ages, were written as like one-off charity books. You know, and they could have been left as that. But no, we gotta keep milking the cow. All right, I'm ready to jump in now. Go, jump. I've talked way too long. No, no worries. <laughs> um, okay, so number one, I will say that I agree with you in the sense that I grew up with Harry Potter. And, you know, I watched the books. I lived, I, I lived the books and the movies. And very much after that, I was like, okay, I'm done. I'm ready to I'm ready to call it done, leave it behind me. You know, it was great. I loved it growing up, but I'm ready to just close this close this chapter of fandom in my life. I'm ready to call it done. However... I need you. I need you all to understand that growing up, especially in high school, I was very good friends with many fangirls out there, mm-hmm. and so I was very keyed in on the Harry Potter fandom, particularly growing up in high school. And I think one of the reasons why I almost became sick of Harry Potter by the time we finally got to Fantastic Beasts was because I was so keyed onto the fan fandom and the fan culture. And uh, especially by my good friend Hillary, who was one of my best friends throughout high school, she was very obsessive with this. And I use her as kind of a spectrum of where the Harry Potter fandom is at, what they want, and how badly they want it. And I can tell you that no matter what J.K. Rowling makes, she can just keep making it forever because the fans will keep demanding it. They have an insatiable fandom. And not not necessarily depending on whether or not the product is bad or good, but they will keep eating it up. Like I I very much agree that it, it's she's very much like writing it as she goes with expanding the lore of Harry Potter. You know, it very much was designed to be the singular story around the singular character. It was not meant to be expanded into this entire world. But she has a fan base where. They don't. They don't care necessarily whether or not it was designed for that. They want it. They want to know more. They want to know what the next thing is. They want to know all this little details. If they make a ride, or if they make a theme park, if they make a play, they they want it. They want it. They gotta have more. They gotta have more Harry Potter. They cannot get enough. Like and, and for I some, I totally agree. I agree. That's exactly why it is the way it is. Yeah. Like in some <laughs> senses, I I can uh, sympathize with J.K. Rowling because she. You can't ever make your fan base like happy enough to go away. She, like, they, she's in a, she's in a bad more. spot. Yeah. So then, then that's the question. Like, would do we as fans have a resp- here's here's a question. Here's a question. Do we as fans have a responsibility to the creators to be like, it's okay, honey, you can stop. 
Because to me, I think we do. I think that we as fans of various media need to be able to respect creators enough to realize we need to let this end. Because In general, I think fans absolutely do. But yeah. I would say that a huge dependent on that is the, I guess, the demographic of your fan group. That is a very good point. I mean, what I mean, I mean, obviously, it's not that way. People aren't like that. They demand yeah. and demand and demand. Yeah. But I think that's a huge aspect of fandom culture that doesn't get addressed. It's like that's what's going on with Voltron right now. It's just like a whole bunch of like ridiculous Fujoshi fangirls who are so obsessed with like these particular like canonical elements that like they're demanding that you do this on my show, blah blah blah. You know, and it's like, mm -hmm. calm down. Yeah. Like. Calm down. Chill out. It's okay. But often, what'll make or break that is the, uh, I guess, the the average age of the fandom. Like, especially with mm -hmm. um, fandoms that attract a much um, an older uh, demographic of people, you see people who are willing to be much more patient and much more understanding when there's something like delays or where there's like problems, and then also very accepting when things finally come to their end. You know, they want a it's it's about what that demographic of fan wants like the older fans they want it to come to an end but the younger fans they want they want more regardless of what that means as far as how how that would damage the story and the overall franchise what can we do what can we do that's as older question. fans that's a very yes. that's a fabulous teach question the youngins because See, that's the problem is I never teach the young ones. I never found the answer to this. So my answer was to just leave all these fangirls, just ditch them and find new friends. <laughs> that is a legit strategy. You'll, you'll get everything from orbits. Leave nothing. That's yes. a legit strategy. No, like, like, y'all I... y'all have talked about Doctor Who a bit, but I'm sorry, I could never give Doctor Who a watch because I was too kidded on the fan culture. It's like they would never shut up about any of this stuff. So it's like I can't I can't give it an honest chance because it's like I've heard a million things about it. I don't care. It's I mean, like I, I, I feel terrible saying it, but as much as I loved Harry Potter growing up, I just don't care about it anymore just because Oh, the I'm exactly culture just doesn't shut I'm, up about it. I I'm the exact same it. way. I am the exact same way. Like I was super like I I like I I was lucky in that I sort of grew out of it in a way. Like by the time mm -hmm. I was like fifteen, like, you know, I was like I was engulfed. Like I really I wish I had proper like visual representation of how deep in the Harry Potter fandom I was until about age like fourteen. Like, Mary on a trench diagram. It was like it was pretty bad. Like I, I need to like I have like tubs. I have like several what, gallon what tubs of like, stuff. Uh, okay. Like, okay. Like I like so here's here's what I, do. I would get like like I'd buy I had like every Harry Potter Lego set. I had figurines. I have my three rag dolls still, and this was stuff before the movies even came out. Like this is like pre movie stuff. When, like, the Universal, like, first option, like, first bought the rights to the series and, like, was putting out um, merchandise based off the books and the book illustrations. Mm -hmm. So, like, I have, like, these, like, some of my, my prized fandom possessions. Some of my prized fandom, of my prized fandom possessions are these three Harry Potter ragdolls that are pre-movies. Because they're in clothing, because the clothing is different. See, this is the kind of shit, this is how deep I was. Like, the clothing <laughs> is different between movie merchandise and pre-movie merchandise. Yes. Like, in the movie merchandise, they have the British the British vest and the, the kind of old school night style. Not night style. The old school British uniform with the little gray skirt and the vest and stuff. And the pre-movie stuff, it's like jeans and t-shirts. With robes over top, so like that's how deep I was in the in, in the fandom. So then to like have to break away from it so dramatically at like age sixteen, seventeen, when I was like, "What are you doing?" Like, like you, I pretty much just uh, aged out of the uh, fandom myself. I mean, for me, the nail on the coffin was one of the twins dying. <gasps> nope. uh, seventh book yeah seventh book that was the nail in the coffin for me because my brother seventh and i book. if you do not know are twins god I mean, oh like, god i didn't even think about that aspect no, of it. I, so, I thought it immediately jk rowling <laughs> single-handedly tapped into our biggest Fear. Fear. See, <laughs> and like that's the thing. Like seventh, the seventh book. I don't want to talk about seventh book anymore. Makes me sad. Yeah, I, I just want to um, uh, just as my uh, little exit stage right from the fandom. I'm like, oh, okay, after this, I'm, I'm done. Because 
I related to those two characters quite a bit. So um, my brother and I in them, and yeah. Rowling sort of reminded me that I'm going to have to go through that someday. So Oh, see, that's rough. Uh, yeah, that's not too cheery. <laughs> not too cheery, my escapist fiction. Ugh. Uh, yeah. So, okay, so we've talked about franchises that we think did well. Um, I guess we talked about, we've I've gone on at length about awful franchises. Yeah. Um, lightning. Is there any... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lightning? Yeah, uh, Lightning, in the Discord you uh, mentioned how we might want to mention some franchises that are still going right now and things yes. that, would, that they're doing right that we admire. Yes. Yeah, because I like to end the fandomoniums on a positive note, so let's yes. wrap up with that. Mm-hmm. So... Um, uh, so I, I mentioned two of them, and y'all are welcome mm-hmm. to talk about one of them if you want to, if you want to claim one. Uh, I know one of the ones you mentioned was South Park, and I do agree with you. Okay. All right, so. well, I'm going to talk James Bond, because I'm pretty sure no one else can talk about James Bond the way I can. Do it. I okay. have no knowledge on James Bond outside of very few films and Sean Connery, so the fluid Wonderful. Here, so. So the wonderful thing with James Bond is that throughout its entire lifetime, it's managed to change directors, actors, production crew, just all these different aspects of creation, but still maintained its same identity. And part of that is because it still had the same, I guess, managing family of people behind it. The original creator was named was um, Albert Broccoli and his partner, Harry Saltzman. Even after the original guy, Mr. Broccoli, died, his daughter, Barbara Broccoli, uh, was still able to take up the franchise and keep the creative vision the same way that her father did, which I've always thought was very remarkable. And um, you, you've also seen with the franchise that over time, as I, I guess culture, pop culture, American culture has changed, so has the, I guess the film's been able to flow with that. For example, um, you know, it, uh, back in the, I guess the the first era with um, J- with um, Sean Connery, you know, they had the, I guess, the the fun spy aspect to it where it was serious, but it was violent, and he was a womanizer, and that was just casually played off or whatever. You get to the 70s when things are a little more campy. I think of that as, like, the, the Scooby-Doo era. That's when, you know, everything was very groovy and relaxed, and you had Roger Moore, who was very much the fun Bond. And it was able to be a spy, and it was all these crazy adventures, but it would be very lighthearted, very fun, very jovial. Then um, you get into the 80s, you get into like the, the hard-boiled, the, the gritty era. You have the, the couple of movies of, um, uh, what's his name, Timothy Dalton, which I think were very good. And it was, it was mm-hmm. kind of like the, the Jason Bourne before there was Jason Bourne, I would say. And um, Sorry, I'm trying to just go back through all of them. Uh, <laughs> after that, you had um, uh, Pierce Brosnan which is kind of the 90s era. And you think of the other sort of 90s action movies that came out around the time, I th- you think of something like um, uh, the Mission Impossible series, the other the other Tom Cruise action films. And it was kind of that um, very explosive, you know, semi-serious, but it's very, very over the top. It was one of those films that helped pioneer uh, special effects. And I, I, I guess the most critical thing that I'm building to is that um, the it was around this time when the... 9-11 happened when the two towers mm-hmm. fell mm-hmm. and you think about the you think about how the movie culture was after that you never saw like a fun playful mission impossible movie right after that you know people took a break from those sort of movies for a while because that sort of thing of like um i guess global terrorism and extreme violence and stuff like that it's it, it's hard to Get too not to approach that as seriously after a serious event like that happens mm-hmm and um, after that, they really had to try and reinvent themselves again. Like, how do we approach this with a more serious light, but, you know, be more careful about it? And the response from them eventually was to go with, um, they, they recasted Bond again. They changed the vision. They went back. They, they decided to essentially reboot the franchise. Start over at the very beginning, the very first James Bond book, the original Bond book. And they went with uh, Daniel Craig. And they changed from going with a, with a very... Um, I guess over the top dramatic style with with uh, Timothy Dalton, and they went very much like more gritty, much more character driven in a way. Like um, I, I don't know if you've, any of you have ever seen Casino Royale, which was the film we restarted it with. I did, I did. Yeah, but you saw they focused a lot more on I, I guess Bond as a person than any of these other previous. Yeah, no, I, I had never really thought about it, but I guess you're right. I hadn't really like I'm not, I'm not super. I'm not. I mean, I watched um. 
Sean Connery and Pierce Brosnan era Bond mostly. Yeah. But uh, I guess you know I had never really thought about, it, but I guess you're right. I've seen a yeah. kind of and Bond in the earlier hours to me came off more as a power fantasy, a fun one, but yeah, more like yeah. just uh, so I want to be this man. Women want him. Men want to be him. Sort of thing. And yes. The, uh, reboots definitely seem more character driven now that you mentioned that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing, I guess the last thing I like to draw to is that the number of times the directors have changed over the years have been staggering. Like you think of how film series like uh, Star Wars or Indiana Jones have been so tied to their directors. Or mm-hmm. God knows like anything uh, Steven Spielberg has touched, uh, Stanley Kubrick, but James Bond, ser- the, the entire James Bond franchise has been able to come in and out and with different directors and still maintain true to their visual identity. They had um, uh, Martin Campbell for a while, who's recognized as a very great director. They've had, um, I'm trying to think of some of the other ones off the top of my head. Um, not Sam Raimi, but um, we went directly. Go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull up their names real quick. Sorry. <laughs> While you're doing that, I actually have a question for you. Do you feel mm-hmm. like the Bond movies lost something when they ditched the goofy campiness? Or do you think the transition to being more serious is something that's was a necessary evolution for them or i don't think they lost something like uh, as an example if you ask most bond fans to make like some kind of tier list of who was the best bond people always have a hard time placing um uh roger moore who was kind of the fun silly bond because on most people's i guess arbitrary rankings he's kind of at the bottom but people look at him and, and his his films and they agree you know e- even though they're kind of out of the ordinary for being that kind of campy compare with some of the more modern ones or the Sean Connery ones or whatever, it's that they still have a place and they're still very good and they still have their own intrinsic value, even though they may have gone down a different path or a different style than the other ones did. You know, it's still James Bond. It's just very different. Okay. And I, I guess just popular opinion would be that the, the more serious ones are definitely more popular, but like those are the ones that people liked more. But, you know, be, there's, there's still definitely a crowd for the, the sort of silly campy roger moore stuff and i think that a trait you see with all the best bonds is that they were able to balance all the different aspects of it like timothy dalton got a lot of flack for being too serious but he's part of why everyone loves sean connery so much is because he could be very serious but he could also stick in those little quips of humor now and then too so you feel um, so you basically so you feel like bond like basically it, you feel like the way it be words it <laughs> remains successful because you feel like it changed with the times in a way appropriately yes Definitely, I would you feel say. Like that's, that. like, you feel like that's a key to its, its success? Yes, especially with, like, a an extended film series like this that goes across, like, a long distance of time. Like, I'm sure you could talk about how um, Doctor Who was kind of changed in styles over time to fit the era, I guess. I think part of the reason that helps with Bond is it's not part of some larger overarching narrative that has to span a certain number of adventures, like... These, yeah. these individual adventures are fairly disconnected from each other. Uh, Fun fact, any time they've tried to do that sort of like overlapping trilogy between the films, it always has fallen down flat. Yeah. <laughs> it's been kind of funny. By so I think so you think so you think see so so we're also looking at the fact that they're kind of standalone is also yes. a big like you could pick up the series wherever you want to. Yeah. And more watch it in any order you want. And because yes. they have time capsules of the era in which they take place in, there's sort of something for everyone. If you prefer mm-hmm. the more silly, go over here. If you prefer the serious, go over here. If you prefer a little blend of the two, here's something for you. So See, I got I... some of those uh, other directors real quick. Just uh-huh. um, uh, besides Martin Campbell, who's kind of the I guess the most famous one. Uh, there's also Sam Mendes. He's done a lot of good stuff. So looking uh, Sid Kane, Gilbert, John Glenn. Another mm. famous one, Peter Jackson. What? When did Peter? When did, when did Peter Jackson oh, do a Bond movie? A Which one? Okay, never mind. He was assistant director then. Oh, okay. Film. I was about to say. I, I was like, oh, right, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I would have known that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All the other ones are um, notable. Was um, yeah. yeah. Only one notable noticeable here that I guess, I guess you know outside of James Bond would be uh, Mark Forster, who did okay. um. Yeah, I'm trying to think of what he did. Uh, Finding Neverland. That was the big thing he made. Uh, Ash. Are there any- okay, well, well, like, okay, so I, I was going to say South Park for various reasons. Um, 
because I like James Bond. Like it kind of it it's moved. Its humor's changed with the times. It was come more political, that kind of stuff. But I was actually thinking while you were talking about that, I actually remembered another franchise I think is doing an okay job right now, and that's the Dragon Age game franchise. Yes. Because <laughs> oh God, rich pieces. Storm's so Storm is so excited. Okay. Okay. So like. So, like, you know, Origins, obviously an amazing game. Um, you know, I know a lot about its production and stuff. It was kind of, like, it was different. Like, they changed, they kind of, like, changed production. Like, because originally, it was originally supposed to be, I feel like, more, like, RTS style. Uh, not RTS. Yeah, more RTS and making more of an RPG. So, it's, it, it's kinda, it can be, a, it's a really, it can be really clunky. It's not, it's not, it's a great game. Like, Origins is an amazing game. Um, but it's also not, like, the best game ever. It's just great. Um, you know, you play it now, it's kind of clunky. And then Dragon Age 2 comes out. And Dragon Age 2 is, like, it's got to be one of, like, the most, like, hotly debated games. Like, there are people who love it, and there are people who despise it. And it's so hard to find people, in the, like me, who are kind of in the middle. Um, but Dragon Age 2 could have killed Dragon Age. It could have killed the entire, because it was rushed. It was, like, they had, they were going to put a game out, they are going to put a game out, and they didn't. Um, and so they, they rushed it, and they put it together. They had this really dumb web series that went with it. Like, it wasn't good. It was okay. Um, what's your faces in it? Um, a name I'm going to think of later. Um, it was a girl who, no, she's, no, no, no. In, in, there was a web series that came out the same time as Dragon Age 2 that had the main girl from the guild and Dr. Sing, Dr. Ho- uh, Dr. Horrible. Um, Redhead, she played Talus. Cannot think of her name. I am blanking. Oh, yeah, I'm, like, I remember, yeah. You know who I'm talking? Yeah. Yeah. I can't, I can't think of her name. I cannot think of her name. I'm completely blanking on. It. I'll think of it like a. Mil- I'll think of it later, and I'll be like, oh, of course. Anyway, but like, no, but it had like because you know, Dragon Age doesn't just have the games. Also has people. Don't, people don't realize it also has its, has book series. Has books. Has not not really a series. It has books and it has comics that are all really good. Like I've read them. They're, they're great books. You know, and they explore the world, all that kind of good stuff. And Dragon Age 2 could have killed the franchise completely because it was so mixed. But they gave it another shot. And then Dragon Age Inquisition came out. And it's not a perfect game, but it is it was it's probably one of my favorite RPGs. It is a it's got. It does a lot of things. It does some things kind of wrong, and it messes up the canon a little bit in some places. But it does a lot of things right, and it's a great game. It's an amazing game, and a lot of people came into the Dragon Age franchise on Inquisition. Like they had, they, they had never played the other two games, whatever. So a lot of people are coming into the franchise in Inquisition, and I think it. I don't know if they intended to do this, but. It is, I feel like it's revitalized. Now they're actually talking about Dragon Age 4. You know, like, what's it going to be? What's it going to be about? Is it going to take place and whatever? And it's, it's, they were able to take a franchise that could have died, give it a little TLC, and keep it alive to keep telling its story. Because there's still some story there to tell. Um, And they're setting it up to keep telling the story. And so, I, you know, it's not it's not a, it's not a perfect situation, but they we're in a good it's in, it's in a good place. It's a franchise that could have died, but now it's in a good place because it was able to pull itself up by its bootstraps. You know, with one game, it was able to be like, you know what, we got this. You know, we can do this. You know, and like revi- and bring new people in the fandom who had no idea what the game was, and also revitalize people who had already who'd been in it for a while already. You know, so I think that's an example of franchise gone right. You know, where it's like, it, and same thing kind of happened with Awakening, but we'll kind of see what happens with that, uh, with Fire with Fire Emblem. But that's a different story completely. But um, yeah, that's you know I got to thinking about it, and uh, I feel like that's one of those situations where it's in a good spot, and we'll just have to kind of wait and see what ends up happening with it. But it's in a it's it allowed itself to get into a good spot. I talked at. Annoying things on Dragon Age in the first Fandemonium, so I will oh. try to restrain myself here. <laughs> Dragon Age is basically, my, it's basically my favorite game. He currently, Origins remains my favorite purely due to story reasons. I agree. Oh the, God, no! I love Dragon Age. I the mechanics. I love Dragon Age. Going back in, especially if you're yeah. I 
I tried to go back and play it recently, and I was like, oh, wow, I forgot what this was like. Yeah, yeah. Um, for my, yeah. my newly built PC mods for the win. Nice. But, nice. Yeah, I was someone that... For me, it was my very first RPG, and it showed me what storytelling could do, really, the power of it could do with some strong characters, and just telling me about the world through those characters. I inferred a lot through them. So yep. I'm really excited to see how Dragon Age continues to build on its this world that they've been making. And a couple of retcons are to be expected in any huge world. Yeah. But uh, for me, let me... You know what, because the comic came out fairly recently, I want to say the Avatar franchise, the Legend of Korra and Last Airbender. Okay. Mm-hmm. Do you you don't feel like you don't feel like the it it should have ended already? You don't you don't, you don't feel like these new comics are like a cash grab or anything? I don't feel that because I feel like Core's era got quite a bit of flack unnecessarily. Like I feel like she got annoyed. He'd be you know, like a lot of fans got annoyed because they were she was replacing Aang, and you know what? Yeah, I'm going to have to retract my statement and just go with the safe bed of the Marvel Cinematic Universe since I am really enjoying this. It's had some shaky steps along the way, but the MCU is going strong. All right. And just because. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, what do you what do you what do you feel like? What, how do you feel like it's able to be successful the way it is? Like, what's your opinion on that matter? Well, for one, they seem to most of the time they find the right directors for it, like. Pretty much the Marvel method is, is this, it, when they find a director, the director pretty much has to agree, this is a larger world, this isn't your movie, it's our movie. You have to sort of shit and play by all of our rules. You have to understand you're making an installment in this bigger universe. It's not something that you can just make separate from this. So this canon you have to adhere to. And some directors don't want to play that game. But when they do, they try to find the best people for the job. Like the Captain America directors, like the first one was shot like a World War II movie. The, the Thor movies were shot like by a Game of Thrones director. Who well, the, the Dark World, I believe. Ragnarok, I think, has a different director. But and the Guardian movies have James Gunn, because he can do no wrong apparently. <laughs> All the movies have this their own distinct feel from each other, so you don't feel like you're getting the same thing too often, even though they may be sharing similar character types and story elements. Like just this, like something as refreshing as the setting can just sort of give a breath of fresh air, and just seeing things just sort of click into bigger escalation, like. You know what's on the horizon, and you're nervous for some of these characters because you don't want some of them to die. But at the same time, they're in the, you're happy the individual franchises have ended. So, yeah, it might be time to kill some of these characters off, mm. even if they could be allies in other people's stories, like how Iron Man seems to keep popping up. I guess I would be kind of happy if there was some sort of like uh, permanent death. Oh yeah, with one of the major characters with the cinematic universe. Because I guess that's one of the things that's I, I guess still making it feel a little soap opera, so soap opera y to me is that everyone's kind of alive at the end of it. There's no one who's getting like permanently has like a permanent end to their story. No one major yet. That's something I enjoyed about Civil War that they didn't resort to killing off characters at that point. I would yeah. have preferred them to, if they are going to kill off characters like Captain America or Iron Man, I would prefer to be in the Infinity War movies. Like, yes. start shaking up the formula then, like, end the trilogy with killing off one of the OG Avengers. Mm-hmm. I don't, a part of me doesn't want to because I love these characters, but eh, they've done their job in the franchise. Time to... Yeah. As long as as long as they don't fridge anybody, like <laughs> they kill them, I'm okay. You know what I mean? 
mean, like, yes, I do. It's not such a problem that it's kind of like, is someone's going to die in a franchise like this? It, it, it needs to feel, it needs to hurt, but in a good way. All right, the absence has to be felt throughout. Exactly. If they kill off Cap or Iron Man, I would prefer like it to be done right, not. I mean, yeah, and they need to not go down like a, not go down like a chump. Like if they're gonna die, like they need to like blaze a glory, you oh, know. And they need, they need to be they need to be saving a city while they're doing it, you mm-hmm. know. Not like I, I hate, hate coming back to it, but like not not like the deaths in Harry Potter, the seventh Harry Potter book, which half of them were bull crap. Anyway. Yeah. I guess just looking at it from a storytelling aspect, that's one thing I strongly feel is that a, a major death like that creates very visible consequences. Mm-hmm. For consequences, and, yeah. Like, if if you fail, this could happen. That sort of thing. And they need to be felt through the franchise, and it needs to matter. Yes. Like, it, if someone's going to die in a major franchise like that, if a major character in a major franchise is going to die, it needs to matter. I mean, arguably that mm-hmm. was Coulson, but uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. sort of undid that. Yes. See, that's yeah. what I mean. That's, that, that's doesn't that's count. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing with Coulson. That's, 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 that's been a thing that's played comic that's, that, Damn. That's been a thing that's played comic books for a long time, is that no one really dies. Like, yes. yeah. death is so impermanent in comics. Like, I don't mind that for Deadpool, because that's kind of his shtick. But that's specific but that's, to Deadpool, yeah. you know. But yeah. that's one of the reasons yeah. Logan is now currently one of my top five favorite comic book movies ever. Yep. Because, no, they did that right. Yeah. If they kill yeah. off any of the Avengers, make it like Logan. Like, have him yeah. go out as best. Mm-hmm. They all are franchises go out in a blaze of glory. Oh, yes. Yeah. And their deaths, and the deaths, and the the repercussions of their deaths be felt through the ages. And may many tears be shed for them. Indeed. Well, guys, thank you very much for joining me on this episode. I hope you all had a blast. And if I had fun being here, hope you guys did too. Yeah. And if uh, your tears be forever salty. And if you guys watching have any recommendations of what you want us to talk about next, uh, leave a comment below or hit us up on Twitter. Until next time, thanks for watching. Bye. 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 Hey guys, Storm here. Hope you liked this episode of Fandemonium. If you did, then consider subscribing to the channel. It really helps us out. If you have an idea for a topic you want to see on the next Fandemonium, then leave a comment down below. We would love to hear what you guys want to see next. That's it for now. Till next time.